Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. This is an old mailbag item that we got. It's a drag up multi worn and it was sent in by Andreas and he's from Germany. So thank you very much, Andreas. Sorry it took so long to get around to it. What it is, is a warning system that's designed to detect different types of gases. You might be able to see different sensors in there. And this particular unit can actually accept different plug in modules for this up to I think there's 35 different sensors for 35 different types of gas or something like that with dozens of different plugins that you can plug into here and it's a gas detection system there's an alarm on the top and it flashes a light and sounds a big siren loud siren you know screaming if it detects um, you know a combustible gas or uh, something like that or a lack of oxygen even for example and they're used by uh, emergency service for, uh, services for example fire brigades uh, might have these are used in the mining industry any sort of underground sort of you know uh, uh, confined spaces type thing to warn you you just carry it around with you um, it's battery powered carry it around with you and it detects all these uh, nasty uh, gases which could uh, kill you or could uh, explode or something like that so you really have to be careful so this could be uh, relatively interesting inside although I think all of the interesting stuff is really inside the actual sensors uh, themselves and how they work so yeah I don't think we're going to uh, get too much into that uh, side of things but anyway um, it is an intrinsically safe product there's the intrinsically safe the EX uh, symbol there and what that means is this is uh, designed and certified to go in underground situations like mines where there are these explosive um, gases and things like that and well it's not designed to ignite though so it doesn't matter how this thing is used where you turn it off and on or you or it goes off you know the siren goes off or you plug the battery in or something like that or it fails internally it's designed to be intrinsically safe so it doesn't ignite any of those gases and there's a lot of certification which goes into intrinsically safe products like this so yeah let's check it out it's got a dot matrix uh, LCD this one is faulty I believe um, Andreas said it was faulty it was too expensive to repair so they just uh, scrapped it it's got a NICAD battery pack in the back here which we can take off hey there we go and D25 connector inside that's really rather interesting um, so this is the NICAD battery pack uh, presumably got some uh, circuitry in here charging circuitry and other uh, such stuff like that but there you go that just plugs in and uh, we can got some screws on the back let's open this puppy up and see so the first thing we'll do is just take off this module it is designed to come out so you can plug, they're designed to be user replaceable, so like for example, if, a, uh, if the fire brigade was on, uh, you know, on, uh, headed to a uh, fire, you know, in a, in a chemical factory or something like that, they may decide, oh, you know, they know ahead of time what factory it is and what sensors to put in here, they could uh, just replace this module in here, and it looks like we've got a rubber surround, so they could, they could replace that on route, there's a little port there, Obviously, that's for uh, outside air. I'm presuming that this has maybe, well, it's got five ports. I'm not sure, you know, that's a free air port there. But also, there was a port on the side here. So I'm not sure if that's like the uh, fresh air sensor or something like that permanently built into the thing because this is designed to be uh, calibrated in fresh air. So you can turn it on, apparently, and then run the calibration when you're out you know in the clean fresh air and then uh, that just um, that just calibrate recalibrates the thing for the current ambient environment that you're actually in generally fresh air but oh yeah, it looks like that doesn't come out it looks like you so much for user user replaceable it looks like we have to uh, yeah it's user oh okay it's a bit compliant with that so it is user replaceable but uh, well, so much for the uh, so much for the fireman changing the thing in the in the back of the truck on route to a fire. Ah, oh, well. So will that pop out? There we go. So aha, there we go. And these are designed to be uh, plug and play modules. 
So, i.e., they've got little identifiers in them so that the firmware inside knows which one you've plugged in so you don't have to reconfigure it or anything like that in software. You just plug it in, it's got an automatic ID system, it knows what it is, and it recalibrates itself. Now, here we go. There must be some sort of pump system in here because this looks like, uh, as we said, came through that filter. There's that extra intake over there, and uh, possibly that's linked to the outside here, so that maybe that's probably the pump. Um, so where they're actually pumping that around, and for what purpose, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, like, how do you get these things out? They're supposed to be user replaceable. I guess you have to get a pair of pliers on there and pull them out. Hmm. Actually, that whole assembly in there, as we saw before, is sort of its own rubber shock mount, and I guess it's got to do that to reduce the noise and possibly vibration from the pump. I'm not sure if the pump continuously operates when you switch this song on. I wouldn't think so, otherwise your battery life would be, uh, uh, you know, wouldn't be great with this thing. So, I'm not sure what the deal is there. Anyway, you know, maybe it just um, uh, does the pump, you know, once every 10 seconds or something like that. I'm not entirely sure how it uh, actually operates and then just, you know, it takes a sample every 5 or 10 seconds or something perhaps. Now, until we actually get down there and look at the labels, I don't know which ones are installed in here, what different types of uh, gases these are designed for, but we can see different types of top elements here. This one has got, it's weird, it's got some sort of, I don't know, uh, you know, rough metallic surface on it, almost like it's little globules of solder or something like that. I'm sure it's not, obviously, but uh, that's what me as an electronics engineer, that's what it looks like, almost. Um, anyway, we've got that particular surface, so it's acting as some sort of filter on top. These things are going to be filtered, and this one has some sort of membrane filter. I'm not sure what that material would actually be. This one looks basically the same, but it's obviously designed, it's a different sensor designed for a different gas. They've got different colors on them, so presumably they're different models. And this one here is a complete uh, molded plastic case, except for it looks like a tiny little vent hole in the top. That's all we've got there. Why so small? These sensors, these are actually can be blocked by uh, you know, water or gross humidity or something like that in the air, at least uh, some of them. So you just have to be careful not to, you know, certainly wouldn't want to immerse this thing, that's for sure. The only way I can think to get these out, uh, apart from pulling them, is give them a, hey, there we go, give it a good whack, and we're out. Look at that, we've got ourselves, these, these two have popped out, aha, you can see the connectors down in there. I'll show you those in a minute, there we go. And this one down here, which is in its own plastic cavity. I'm not sure why. There we go. Ta-da! We're in like Flynn. Look at that. Uh -huh. So it turns out this one with the plastic surround here is different. It's got a pin header. It's got a standard 0.1 inch pin header. It's got a uh, polarity uh, hole plugged up there. So that's what this module plugs in for. I still don't know what it does. There's nothing uh, EX sensor, so that's intrinsically safe sensor C. I don't know, I'll have to uh, take a close look at that and decode that to see what uh, that is. But anyway, it looks like there's, maybe that one is for like semi-permanent uh, installation. It's only plastic, but uh, perhaps that's different. Anyway, the other three physically use a smaller, uh, smaller pin pitch connectors there, and they're male instead of uh, female. So, entirely different, and that's what these sensors plug into and they're plug and play so obviously they've got some sort of ID system on there whether Lübeck there you go I've been to Lübeck fantastic little town in Germany I loved it I went to an organ recital in Lübeck there you go at <laughs> one of the churches there um, that was something uh, yeah so these are rather interesting whether or not they do it with just like a resistor value or something like that you could and the firmware just reads the resistor value, but that'd be the easiest way to easiest way to do it. Otherwise, you could have like a, a little Maxim, you know, laser engraved ID uh, chip or something like that, uh, perhaps, or some sort of, you know, E squared prom or um, you know something I squared C, because you only got a couple of pins available there. But anyway, uh, so that's the raw sensor. Whether or not these have any uh, amplifiers in them at the bottom, I guess we'll find out by taking them 
a part or whether or not they uh, are you know analog output just direct analog output so we'd only supply like a power we'd get analog output and then we'd have the ID the pin ID uh, system whether or not that's the case uh, or whether or not they do actually contain an amplifier and the board in here is expecting you know a, a, a correlated like you know a one volt analog output or something like that because uh, this thing does actually it, you know it measures value so it's got to have ADC it's got to be an analog output uh, sensor and it does data logging as well I think I forgot to uh, mention you can actually uh, log data for like 50 hours or uh, something like that so yeah I don't know might have to crack these open but let's get the rest of the box open first I think now it will be interesting to see inside if the PCB is uh, conformally coded or not um, you don't have to for intrinsically safe uh, devices although it may be probably not it'd be my guess but uh, certainly would not surprise me if we found a conformally coded board I don't expect anything fancy I expect a you know an 8 or a 16 bit micro or something like that driving the uh, LCD and uh, with a ADC either built into the micro if it's not uh, that a demanding a requirement that's a long screw or um, or whether or not uh, it uses an external you know precision ADC something like that could very well do but we'll find out but I don't expect much else I expect a microcontroller on, on the electronic side of things a microcontroller maybe some signal conditioning that one that one's feeling quite quite weird almost as if it's slipping so I don't know yeah it's not just gonna oh yeah hey there we go we're in ta-da look at that that's pretty easy I think it's gonna there's a board on the front for the PC uh, for the LCD as you'd expect so the rest of this hopefully just pulls out <laughs> There we go, it was just held in with a, a pin header on the back side of the board there. There's our, oh yeah, it is conformally coated. Yeah, there you go, you can see the gloss of the conformal coat. So yeah, it just had the uh, pin header down in here, oh, the uh, female. And down there on the uh, LCD, we've got our male pin headers down there, which then plug into the board. Neat. So what we've got here is a two board construction, right angle uh, D25, as you'd expect. So double sided uh, load on that. So there's quite a bit of uh, stuff going on on that board. But that's a uh, processor, as I said, 8 16 bit uh, micro, maybe some latches or something like that. Very old school sort of design. Um, so I'm not sure of the vintage of this one. But. Uh, might be able to get a chip uh, date code or something like that. So we've got ourselves a battery for the battery backup, of course, for the uh, real-time clock. That could be the real-time clock chip there. If it is quite old school, yeah, there's a 32. That'd be the 32 kilohertz watch crystal next to it, because of course, being a data logger, you've got to uh, uh, date and time stamp everything, and then uh, probably some analog stuff happening on the bottom, perhaps. But there is a secondary board here I'm not sure if that's just it's well shielded look at that they've really gone to town to put the uh, that metal foil all over that that's yeah that's really going to town so I'm not sure if that's part of the intrinsic uh, safety of it or whether or not uh, it has to do with um, yeah just um, you know in, in keeping out uh, interference for the sensor board so yeah we've got some circuitry down on there can see some resistor networks and stuff like that so we're probably oh yeah 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 I think it's going to be chocker too so there's lots of analog stuff happening on here but I think this is going to be a lot of old school I probably expect a lot of 74 series logic like I'd probably expect these to be you know latches or something 74 series latches or something like that perhaps and there's the top side of the board there uh, this connector here is the pump output so it goes directly up into the pump mechanism in there there we go there's the uh, there's the reservoir for it and 
the pump just drives that boom boom on a uh, offset shaft there and boom it just drives it in and out something like that and uh, generates a bit of pressure whether or not it's noisy you wouldn't think it'd be you know hugely noisy or something like that so yeah um, this as I said most likely that oxygen sensor if I can uh, Google that part number aha no 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 that's not an oxygen sensor that's going to be a pressure sensor of course making sure that the pressure inside the system is still good here is going to be your oxygen sensor i'm presuming once again it's an oxygen sensor and they've got that sensor going directly down to the analog board down there there we go two pin header that's a bit that's a bit dodgy and how you do it look at that don't like that gee they could have done that a bit better at least have a locking connector or something like that not impressed there and uh, the uh, pressure sensor of course I could yeah you can look up that number there it is PA6 GF25 I have no doubt that's a pressure sensor should have known that I used to work on pressure sensors a lot back in the day but that also goes down to the analog uh, board down there nothing special so that's what we've got in the whole system so my guess ambient oxygen sensor plus the plug-in uh, units I still don't know what that one down there is with the separate connector it's obviously got nothing to do with uh, this pump system actually no I stand corrected again I've gotten this out and it gets more interesting as we get into this thing there's a vertical board here there's some sort of sensor board there's another sensor embedded in this part here this is really interesting. This is why it needs to pump. It needs to flow the air across there. I still think it is the oxygen sensor, but it's really interesting. Look, they've got a mirrored, a real, like a polished mirror or something in there. Almost looks like a gold type finish or something like that, which is, you can see it's sort of welded on the back there. So they're obviously, this, so this, I don't think is a sensor. This is like the, um, uh, like a probably an infrared aha I reckon this is going to be an infrared lead bounces through there off the back and we've got ourselves a photo sensor here which can detect the oxygen level aha that's what it's got to be just like those uh, cheap ass eBay pulse oximeters you can buy that uh, clip on the end of your finger they just clip on there and they put they shine infrared light um, through your finger and based on that you can work it uh, based on you know absorption and uh, stuff like that you can work out the level of oxygen in your blood I reckon a similar sort of thing is probably happening here we've got ourselves an infrared lead transmitting bouncing off the back and then you know maybe you know that why that they've obviously gone to a lot of trouble there it's not just a mirror it's a specific type of mirror so specific type of material so whether or not that's doing some uh, filtering or something or you know, some such thing I don't know I'm uh, certainly no expert on that side of things but here's our second board down the bottom here we can pull that off there we go they got a little flex membrane going there so it's all really quite a bit of a mess going together here so that's only a interface board really nothing uh, fancy there at all but they've gone to a lot of effort to sort of integrate that in to that whole pump system <laughs> it just seems very convoluted like they could have easily done something a, a lot more attractive and uh, sensible than that I would have thought and that plastic ring on that connector there it's just that it's a plastic ring so yeah I <laughs> to stop but presumably to stop the wrong modules being forced into uh, the wrong hole so why they've gone to that effort there's obviously one module which you know they really don't want as part of this modular um, system it's designed to be plugged into a separate connector what that one is I don't know you'd have to read the user manual I haven't read the user manual that'd be too much trouble wouldn't it and it would ruin all the fun of trying to figure out all this yourself actually this is getting rather confusing the more I think about it I'm the first thing I'm, I'm thinking now is that well, why do you need the pump the pump isn't needed just for uh, an infrared uh, oximeter for example that could easily work without the pump so that doesn't make sense that they would need a pump for that so 
I, yeah, I don't know. Oh, eh, eh, I get it. I, I just got it. I just got it. Okay, yep, duh. Um, where does the pump go? Look at this bottom here. Here's the inlet. Okay, this is actually, I think this is the inlet up here, and that's what plugged into. Aha, there you go. That was our port on the top. So there you go. That's designed to plug an external probe into it. And then, of course, when you've got an external probe, you need the internal pump to suck it into the chamber in here to actually analyze it. And I'm also thinking that this is may not just be an oxygen uh, sensor. It might be doing other stuff as well. I, you know, I think I'd better go to the manual for this one. And yes, yeah, sure enough, it all becomes quite clear when you read the manual. Should do that first, RTFM. Um, yeah, the internal pump is an optional thing, which, look, he's a happy dude there. He's uh, checking a re remote, the hose coming out there, and checking a sample port on this pipe here. It's probably got some stuff running through it. He's checking whatever, uh, you know, for the presence of gases or uh, something within that uh, pipe, that it's a suitable level. And there you go. You can draw uh, 45 meters. That's pretty good. So there you go. So that um, answers the question about the noise and stuff like that. Who cares, you know, how uh, quiet it is? It's not continuously operating. It's only when you uh, choose the internal pump. And they also differentiate between this, which, yes, uh, confirmed it is an infrared uh, sensor. That was uh, pretty easy. <laughs> I was pretty sure I wasn't going to be wrong there. But this, uh, what they call a CAT EX sensor, which is the one that plugs into here, which is this module here. You can choose to switch between these two, and they might be the same sensor for the same gas. Uh, for example, or not the same sensor, but the same, uh, are uh, detecting the same gas. You can choose between two different types. This one, which uses whatever method, um, and the infrared one. And there's a page which explains that. Ta-da! Here it is. I-R-E-X. So the infrared one versus the cat. So the infrared operates in environments with low or no oxygen. Aha! And the infrared one is immune to poisoning and inhibiting uh, compounds that affect this poor sucker here. So there you go. So you can have both of those in there and you can choose, um, uh, well, th there you go, uh, different responses, different compounds versus catalytic uh, sensor, which is this one here. So there you go. You can choose during operation which one you want, even though they're detecting the same gas, useful for different environments. Terrific. Thought of everything. So why don't you just use the infrared for everything? Well, I don't know. I'm sure one of these uh, catalytic uh, sensors is uh, going to be better performing in some situations. And as it turns out, I believe this one is actually a methane uh, sensor, but you can get uh, different types. You can get ones that do hydrogen and what's called nonane. Never heard of it. Anyway, for uh, you uh, chemistry buffs out there, it's C9H20. Go figure. Now I've figured out why we've got different sensors here. These are, well in this case, this one's an oxygen sensor. There we go, O2, and this one's a uh, hydrogen sensor, H2. So these are just uh, regular sensors, but this one is a catalytic uh, sensor, as I said, and this one is designed to, uh, that's why it's got a different, physically different connector on it. It needs power for an internal heating element in there, uh, designed to detect uh, combined combustible gases and this is the EX sensor C and here's how it works and ta-da we don't even have to open it this is what is going to be inside this sensor here and it looks like it's fully potted anyway I don't think I'm really gonna be able to uh, get in there properly thankfully uh, Draeger have provided an, an exploded internal diagram fantastic what we've got inside here is basically a catalytic bead sensor and it's based on the Pallister principle where yes it's like a resistance but the resistance value changes with the gas in there so what we've got is we've got ourselves a, a uh, heating element here and a sensing element and basically you heat it up to a couple of hundred degrees uh, I'm not sure exactly what temperature it gets to but heat it up very hot and what it does is it actually burns the gas inside that's why you need the flame arrestor here because you don't want it to you know actually catch a light inside there and fl you know flames to shoot out with these combustible 
uh, gases. So that's what they're doing, which is funny in an intrinsically safe uh, sensor and intrinsically safe device to actually burn the combustible gas you're actually trying to detect. Hilarious. Anyway, what they're going to do is burn the gas in there and if, of course, the more combustible the gas in there, the hotter it actually gets, and which changes the resistance of the detector element, which is a platinum uh, coil. And that's pretty much all there is to it. It's rather neat. I like it. And it gets even neater than that. The reason that they showed two coils here, one's not actually the heater element, they're not actually showing the heater in there, but one, they've called it a compensator element. And what that is basically doing is, uh, a, that one is not reactant to the uh, temperature change. So this allows them, this is uh, built into a Wheatstone bridge circuit, and that allows them to compensate for ambient temperature, because they've got the one that changes with the gas, uh, the burning gas pressure in there, and one that doesn't. So that allows them to compensate for that ambient temperature changes. Brilliant. So yes, the gas inside here can actually explode because, hey, we're trying to detect combustible gases. They're going to combust, right? So uh, in, to stop it, yeah, they've got this flame arrestor here and a center disc inside the thing, which basically uh, controls the reaction. It uh, stops it blasting out the end here, but it also uh, stops the reaction internally. So when it does, if it does explode, it sort of self-extinguishes itself, and that's why you can use these sensors in an intrinsically safe uh, product designed in a combustible environment. Yes, they do combust it, but hey, do it safe. And I might see if I can dig open one of these puppies and, uh, ta-da, hello, what have we got in there? Ah, well, let's see if we can't hack into that with a pair of side cutters. Brilliant. I've got my hacky pair of side cutters, not my good ones. And what? That was a waste of time. Don't know what's going on there. Anyway, potted inside there by the... That's interesting. No, hang on. Ooh. Ooh. What is that? That's interesting. Jeez, I've never... Never encountered that before. <laughs> Not sure what material that is. No idea. Anyone got a clue? Anyway, there is a wire hanging off there. So, whoop, oh, I just broke it. Oh, stuff in there. Oh no, look at that. There you go, that's weird. There's a couple of wires. You can see them going, that's soaked in some sort of, well, I won't call it electrolyte material, but some sort of soaked in something. And there's obviously some sort of sensor down in there. Not sure what, right down in there, and there's, yeah, that wire was going through to the top of there. So anyone, anyway, if anyone has any idea how this hydrogen sensor works, I don't know. And unfortunately, the um, PCB down in there is uh, potted as well. Oh, right, over to the PCB, and uh, I'll try and scrape off this conformal coating. Looks like this one's coming off. Relatively easy. Ah, I see an M in there. I see the big M. I see the golden arches. And no, it's not Maccas. Oh, bloody Mickey D for you Yanks. It's Maccas here. So, no surprises for finding a Motorola something or other. Ta-da! Motorola MC68L11. Um, say, well, basically it's a 68HC11, as you might be more familiar with. The L stands for the low voltage version, which goes down to, wait for it, folks, 3 volts. Oh. But back then, um, that was absolutely stunning. So, um, yeah, there you go. Obviously, for battery operation, they're using a... Um, low voltage version now this is probably all the uh, firmware in here which is in that puppy over there is probably all in assembly language it could be in c but it could have been originally written in c but more likely assembly language because uh to get a product like this certified as intrinsically safe every line of code in this thing must be verified. You pay someone like a hundred bucks per line of code to actually go in and verify that it's all okay and it's not going to explode or something like that. So yeah, um, so more than likely written uh, directly in assembler. 
And those other chips, yep, I was right, latches, there we go, 74HC574s. Is that a date code I can see there of the 27th week 01? Possibly. The number on that one's not easy to make out, so get some of the magic spit and uh, put that on there. Might come up a bit later. better. Let me get the right angle on that. And you probably can't read that, but uh, I can. It's just an NEC uh, memory, so yeah, that's just coupled to the processor on the other side. And just some random ones next to it, 74HC320. So as I said, all these are probably going to be uh, just, you know, pretty generic uh, 74 series logic. Nothing much happening at all. Now this array of components down here is quite interesting. What I think, there's no analog stuff happening here. This is another analog latch. So all of this stuff is digital. So what this is, because of its proximity down to the external connector down here, for intrinsic safety, what they've done is they've got resistor limiting and diode clamp in here. So that's, they've, that's why they've got so many in that symmetrical arrangement near the connector there. So all of the I.O. go into this connector for intrinsic, uh, intrinsic safety reasons is all going to be resistor current limited and diode clamped. And you're going to see the same thing over here with this D25 connector as well and probably this external, uh, external connector here. They're all going to have the same arrangement. And if we rip apart what we'll call the analog board here, interesting, they've got some marks on there. Uh, they've done that before it was uh, conformally coded. You can see the coding over that. So I'm not sure why they're marking that, those because they just look like resistor arrays to me. Um, nothing fancy pantsy going on there at all. They've got some board, some like elephant hide under there, hot snotted in place. That's interesting. That'd be for intrinsic safety reasons. There's no other reason why they'd have that cardboard in there, that's for sure. And uh, there we go. There's the bottom side of presumably our analog board. Fine pin pitch part there. Ooh fancy pantsy stuff, probably just some more 74HC interface stuff here on top would be my guess. Um, and yeah, that is a four layer board too. Well that's interesting, a Philips uh, PCF8577 I2C interface, of course Philips invented that, um, LCD driver. So there you go, that's driving the big LCD, the dot matrix LCD on the front. Which is strange because they have a proper LCD module down there with the LCD drivers, so... Huh? And it seems that I don't have to scrape the conformal coding off this to see the numbers in there. If I get it at the right angle under my Mantis microscope, I can see clean through the uh, conformal coding straight through the numbers. And nothing is revealing. We've got three op amps down here, just uh, 27 L2s, nothing happening, just, you know, dual op amps. These are all 74 series logic all around here. And well, nothing, and all up here, so nothing else on the top side there. And on the other side here, we've got a couple of quad uh, op amps going on. Once again, uh, 27 L4s there instead of the uh, dual version. And some muxes, some 4000 series, you know, 4051 uh, type muxes going on around here, but that's it. So that literally is just an analog uh, interface board really going over uh, via uh, presumably this uh, header cable here over to the main board and of course there is no ADC on this board or not as a separate chip so it is built into the microcontroller of course this is an E-series uh, 68HC uh, or even though it's the L version 68HC 11E series so it's got an 8 channel 8 bit ADC built in so yeah fairly crude measurements nothing fancy but that's doing all your data logging all your memory over there is holding all your data logging uh, stuff and well yeah there's not much else to it really fairly old school stuff couple of op amps and uh, ADC built into a microcontroller pretty much as expected but of course the most interesting stuff is to be found in these sensors and things like that. Yeah, sorry I can't get that apart and the other one just didn't come apart. So yeah, I don't know. But this infrared uh, sensor, rather interesting. Look, they've actually got, uh, this is the infrared uh, transmitter here. But they've obviously got another 
sensor in there and another something, another sensor happening down in there. It's a two pin uh, TO92 package device just bent over at right angles like that and shoved through a hole in there. Doesn't come out as a separate hole inside there though. Well actually that, what I thought would be the infrared lead there is not. It's got like four ohms. And also, given that looks like a just a bent uh, TO92 package like that, potted in there too by the way. They've got some potting compound down the bottom there so can't really get it out intact. But um, I am suspecting that that is a temperature sensor against the, uh, against the top metal there. Uh, that would be that would be my guess about what's going on there because the, usually plastic TO92 packages like that aren't a uh, top entry uh, sensor even if it does have like a transparent or a, a, you know a transparent um, in, encapsulant there usually they're on the side they're actually a side emitter so yeah my guess is because they've got the top surface there attached to uh, you know, basically uh, thermally coupled through to that metal, my guess, and being two pin, my guess, yeah, temperature sensor. Although this being an infrared sensor, it is quite perplexing because this is obviously a three terminal device. Whatever is encapsulated in this side of the housing over here, and this certainly isn't a uh, a lead, that's for sure. So, unfortunately, I've had no luck trying to get this sucker out. It just won't budge. I've taken off the retaining screw clip in there, and it just ain't budging. And curiously, that uh, reflective backing piece there, which is you know some sort of gold mirror or something like that, um, has got an individual serial number. Whether or not that's a serial number for the whole unit, or whether or not it's just the serial number for that back surface. It could be that important that they had to individually serial number and uh, presumably test and characterize that before they actually uh, welded that in place. Hmm. I just had a thought. Now I think I might know what's going on here. And by the way, check this out. You can see the angle on that mirror. I just noticed that, of course, because it has to, uh, the angle is going to be important to focus it down into the detection uh, chamber down in here. What we've got, what I think is happening here, is that uh, we've got a heater element here, and that is what's um, heating up and generating the infrared source. We've got our, uh, you know, our polished and, and perfectly, uh, you know, aligned mirror that then reflects that down into the chamber down here. And what we've got is a reference temperature sensor down in here, a reference sensor, uh, presumably, and then we've got the actual detector for the, uh, for the signal. So that's what they're doing. It's sort of like a differential between the reference sensor and the temperature sensor under test, and then that way you can uh, take out any ambient uh, temperature differences. Possibly. I don't know. That's my best guess. And if you're curious to see inside the battery pack, well, there we go. We've got a conformally coded uh, charging uh, PCB down in here, which then plugs at right angles into there. That's rather neat. I like that. And it looks like uh, we've got ourselves a baseboard that uh, that's used as the connection, uh, the external uh, external connection to power through to the main board. So yeah, really interesting arrangement really. Looks like there's a charging port on the uh, top here, but that looks like it's all gunked up. Looks like it's totally sealed once again for the intrinsic safety. So yeah, that's really heavy and uh, probably fully potted. So I don't think there's any chance of me getting that out anytime soon. So there you go, that's the Draga or Draga, I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, I'm sure. Multi-worn, it's the Multi-worn 2, um, actually. And uh, that was really rather interesting, a bit more involved than what I thought. And uh, rather is fascinating. So if you've got any more details on how, say, the infrared uh, sensor and stuff like that works, then uh, please link it in, because that's fascinating. But there you go, 
whole bunch of detectors. Fascinating technology. And I'm sure there's a whole bunch of, you know, really good science behind all this stuff too. You could do a PhD thesis on just, you know, how various different types of infrared sensors. There are different types of these, um, different techniques for actually uh, doing it. There's an open one which actually works in um, open air, which is, you know, uh, much huger than this, you know, like in the scale of meters and things like that for, you know, big uh, plants and, and stuff like that detection. But this is fascinating how that's uh, just, you know, linked in like that. And then you can plug a, a probe on the top here and you can sniff things and fantastic. I like it. Fascinating technology. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, if you want to discuss it, the EV blog forum is the place to do it. The link is down below. Catch you next time.